Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm going to be reacting to two videos. You can be an atheist Hindu, atheist Hindu, Hindu Academy Jedi Kandi. So this is the first video. You can, I don't have the thing up because one of my monitors went dead somewhere. Is it over that, that? Anyways, one of these, you can see the two different videos, but this will be first. Let's go and get started. Me want to have like a, a hin be Hindu or have a religion or culture when you can learn the values from elsewhere. And the second question is, um, before there was any religion, people used to like, uh, pray to the moon and the trees. So did God create us or did we create God? The first question is very close to my heart. I love this. Do you know why? This is what I do in schools and colleges. Suppose I tell a youngster, suppose you don't care for religion because it comes with too much baggage. You know, you have to go this and do this and you know, fast on this day and don't do this. And you say, I got too much baggage. I don't care for religion. They say, go to the temple now, you must go and worship, I don't care to do that. Suppose you are like Hindu like that, a youth said, I can't relate to it, I can't relate to it. Does it mean you are a horrible monster and going to hell and be roasted? No. <laughs> Some religions, I meet yeah. so many individuals who do not tick their names to any religion. They dislike religions, in fact, they are put off by religion. Do you know why they are put off? So much nonsense has taken place in the name of religion, it has put them off. Don't blame them, never blame them. Does it mean there are any less spirit, this, as this youngster said, suppose I don't wish to relate to religion, does it mean, what, what is my position then? What does Hindus, Hindus have to say about that? It is say, go for it, my boy, go for it. What do you like? Suppose you say, no, I don't like religion, but I like, you know what, I like science. Oh, I love maths. Ah, this is the breath of Hinduism. It says you can be spiritual, enlightened, excited about life and live life to the full without taking your name to any religion, including the Hindu religion. It gives you that freedom. You can be as spiritual as you like without ever visiting, stepping into a temple. Suppose you like music, suppose you like art and dance and drama and poetry and literature and science. Already you are showing to the rest of the rest of the world and to yourself that you already evolved out of the animal kingdom and you are no longer even satisfied with the human kingdom, you are moving further into the kingdom of the spirit, into becoming a true humane person. So you can be a perfect human being, finding your excitement not through religion, but through other disciplines, through other enterprises. And the one that I love, I promote, is science. Science is a thrilling enterprise. Suppose you're excited by music, science, or I say, go for it, my boy. You are going to get to the same destination <coughs> with the different, you know, using your own, your own route. Go for it. This religion says, look, I'm showing the breath of religion, this religion. Path of bhakti, devotion or love towards science, uh, music, art, whatever it may be. He says you can relate to the idea of spirit by going to a temple. Don't, don't under, this is suitable for those people. They like temple and tinkling bells. Let them do it. It's their baby. It's their way of unfolding. Don't undermine it. This is one way. You can relate to the idea of the spirit by looking inwards and saying, who the heck am I, first of all? Let's sort me out. Then we'll sort about, we'll talk about God. What is my credibility? By searching inwards, forget about going out, inwards, you can be spiritual without going to a temple. You can just meditate and say, I'm trying to sort out who the heck am I first. Then I'll try and make sense of the world. First, let me make sense about who I am. What is my actual identity? That too is fine. There's a third one. So you can be spiritual in a theistic mode, belief in a theos, a god. You can be spiritual in a non-theistic mode, no theos, no god. I just want to say, who, who, what is this human being? Make sense of myself. Second way, non-theistic. Third way, you can be spiritual in a non-religious mode without ever taking your name to any religion. Well, let's stand up that anyway. So um, I like to I like to think of bhakti as not just a love for God. I like it to, to be, say, a love or a devotion towards something. Hopefully, something meaningful. Like uh, we tend to put our full awareness or attention on something that is, in my opinion, bhakti or devotion or love for that, love for your fellow mankind, love for your child, love for your loved one. <clears throat> You're not limited to just loving one thing. But you can love many things and that's what i like to think of bhakti uh, i don't know if necessarily bhakti just means love for god if it is i don't like to think about it that way but it can be obviously but it's just i like to think of it as a love a love or devotion to something that's generally good <laughs> so whether it's the love for humanity and wanting to do good things in the world or love for your significant other and wanting to do good things for them or 
love for your garden and wanting your garden to grow, devotion and love and dedication towards that. Perhaps that's a little, you know, below related to bhakti, but still, nonetheless, I like that. So let me pause it and let me get the other video. Okay, so this is the other one, how an atheist became a teacher of Hinduism. I believe that's uh, Swami Vivekananda, is it not? Kind of looks like him. Anyways, let's go ahead and start. You see, when I was, say, 17 or 16, 16, 17, I was becoming almost atheistic. I worked out in my mind that this issue about God, religion, it's just make-believe. It is all, all, you know, old story. It's not really genuine. It's not real. It cannot be real. It doesn't seem right. So I was actually becoming an atheist, saying that I'm really kind of challenging the ideas of religion. I wasn't convinced by religions at all. And this idea of a super personality called God looking over our shoulders saying, hello chaps, I'm looking after you and you behave and so on. I couldn't believe that. I had difficulty in relating to this idea of a super personality called God, an atheist. And I was studying at Imperial College, studying physics, you know, modern science, and that's very straightforward. You, know, you can use your rational faculties, your common sense to come to terms regarding the nature of reality. No exaggerations, everything can be properly verified through experiments and through a very, very cohesive system of thought, theories, hypotheses. You could relate to that. It's a far better enterprise than this enterprise of religion whose sell by date is gone, surely. So I was being kind of in that state of mind. And when I was in that state of mind, at the age of 17, studying at Imperial College, living in a little room in Earl's Court, you know, st students' digs, at that stage, suddenly, I discovered a treasure house. I suddenly discovered that what I was searching for, kind of a, an understanding about religion on a rational forma format, was possible. And this became visible when I started to study the life and teachings of this modern spiritual giant of India, this Vivekananda. One day, middle of December, when I was 17, books arrived about the stories of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda in the little room that I was staying in next to the university, in the digs. And in the middle of the night or whatever, late in the evening, I started reading the life story of Ramakrishna. When I had read about 50 or 60 pages, something stirred up within me because somehow it is as if my inheritance was given back to me. And the stirring up made me sit cross-legged quietly. I had not learned the word yoga. I had no clue what it means. I had never studied or put any discipline in my life into practice. And yet, as if it is nat the most natural thing for me to do, I sat cross-legged the, in the bed in the middle of winter, cold wind weather, and very quietly closed my eyes and went into the deepest of meditation that perhaps you only read about in books. This was a very dramatic experience. A 17-year-old boy drawn to the idea of spirit, in a way the catalyst was this personality called Ramakrishna who triggered a very powerful spiritual experience. So this young man, this young boy sitting on the bed suddenly let me tell you how intense the experience and what it involves. You see, you sit, you somehow feel naturally kind of drawn to sit sit up straight because you are now going to experience your 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 majestic nature of the spirit. So somehow something tells you to sit up straight and up, be upright. So you sit up straight, very firm, very sure that you are now going to hit the jackpot. It's with that confidence you begin the journey even. You are sure you're going to hit the jackpot straight away. So you sit like that. Close your eyes, there's traffic outside, Cromwell Road, a lot of traffic cars and trucks passing, late in the night, cold weather, and suddenly at the base of the spine you see a stirring, stirring a beginning. You never heard about it, you don't know what the heck is hitting you. Okay. The moment the stirring begins at the base of the spine, slowly your body sensations disappear. So first thing that you feel the cold weather on your skin, and suddenly that disappears. You don't feel the weather at all. You don't feel hot or cold anymore. The, the traffic or the noise of the traffic begins to disappear very fast, disappears. You are quite comfortable and yet you know you are not the body. 
the study at the base of the spine begins to rise very gently, very slowly. It is as if you're, you know, when you get when your foot falls asleep, you feel as if you lost your sensation. So the studying begins like that, but in no time you feel as if you lost, if you like, all link with your body and all the five senses stop operating. This is, if you like, the beginning of living this idea that I am the body and discovering that you are more than the body, you are not the body. The body is then left on the sideline and is no longer interfering with your being. And the first, exp first time you get that experience, the amount of freedom it offers you, the thing that you shout, long to shout out about is freedom, freedom, I am free. This limited vision you had regarding yourself as the body has now been put, pushed aside forever. You push it aside forever. And now you know, not, you're not read in a book, or you don't just have to believe, you know you are not the body. And that is such a very a thrilling experience that it allows you to progress further in your spiritual experience. So as this turning up goes higher and higher in your backbone, there is a real physical activity taking place when you have a spiritual experience. I mean, when people say, oh, they, had, they felt a, a kind of a chill down the spine, in a way they are, in a way, reflecting this thing that the spine or the, the, the column in the spine seems to have come alive in the, spiritual, at the, the level of spiritual experience. So it real, you get a real stirring and real kind of movement in the spine taking place, rising from the base and moving higher and higher. So it seems like, is this Kundalini Yoga that he's doing? by accident? Because he said he's, this is something that he was doing, I believe, in a room, and I mean, something he, he didn't talk to a guru about, he's just reading a book, and I believe uh, said guru was talking about how this is kind of dangerous if you have no experience, you need someone who has experience in this, but it seems like it's Kundalina, uh, Kundalini Yoga, is, is, is that what he's doing here? When it reaches a certain level, I said the first first thing you say is you are free of the body and that gives you tremendous release, tremendous empowerment. You now know you are not the body. In fact, people who have near-death experience also have the similar idea because for the first time they realize they continue to exist even though they are not in the body and the bodily functions have been left aside and they are no longer linked with the body. They are quite aware of it and they feel very free. The first thing that they feel is, thank God. You are not tied up to the body, you are not imprisoned in the body. That's the first feeling you get even in the spiritual experience. So you begin to feel this is the beginning. And yet this is still not spiritual. You just basically has told you you are more than the body. And the body is your outer garment. This is no longer in, uh, something that you accept intellectually, you actually experience it for yourself. You see, the next stage is the most marvelous stage of a spiritual experience. What happens is this. You come across the most brilliant light Nobody's ever told you about it, you never read it in a book. But you come across the most brilliant light and you stare at the light and the words that kind of, you don't have body or words to speak, but the thing that kind of, the, the uttering that up, uh, arises from right within your system, your whole being, is saying, ah, ah, what is this? What is this? That is the experience. What is this? What is this? It is the most bewildering, most exciting, most unique experience because you may think, well, when you go out, you know, sightseeing and you go to the Alps or the Himalayas and you see those marvelous sights and say, wow, what, wow, this is nothing, that is nothing. This is where you got the real wow factor. People talk about wow, this is the real wow factor. You go, ah, as my mentor Ramkar said, you go, ah, me, ah, me, what is this, what is this? That is the experience you get. When you encounter the spirit, when you encounter this marvelous, brilliant light, it's not a physical light. It is, if you like, the light of consciousness itself. You are facing, if you like, you are looking at yourself. So initially you feel that you are the observer and there is this brilliant light in front of you that you are observing. But that is the beginning of the experience. In the next stage, in no time, you realize what a nonsense. You are not observing the light. You are the light. And that is the most unifying, most, if you like, um, exciting experience anybody can have. You are freed forever from a very limited vision you have regarding yourself. Forever you are freed. You come face to face with your essential nature of the Spirit. Not gimmicks, not book learning, no, no linguistic you know, jargon. You come face to face with the deeper reality, your inner being, your inner self. So if you like, this is the culmination. What I was 
was experiencing at a much younger age suddenly became culminated into this very powerful spiritual experience. And you see, in, at that stage in my life, I had this tremendous power that I could cross my legs any moment and go into that deep state of meditation at will. You can imagine the fun we had. <laughs> so that was, if you like, the culmination. At the, at the age of 17, I said, because of the catalyst, my mentor, this Ramakrishna, stirred it up. If you like, gave me the inheritance that was already perhaps mine. But this gentleman was the catalyst. It's not me. Hundreds of people around the world have claimed that this Ramakrishna, when he was alive, he gave spiritual experience to lots of people. Even after he's gone away, he continues to give spiritual experience to hundreds of people around the world. Even his name or his picture conjures up the spirit within us. So this is, if you like, my private journey. Hmm. How an atheist became a teacher of Hinduism. <clears throat> That's actually pretty interesting. So it just all started with a book about Ramakrishna and him sitting in a um, room, I guess. I can't, I, I can't remember what the name of it. Like, I guess during college times or something like that in Cromwell. Cromwell? <clears throat> hmm. But I'm guessing how an atheist become a teacher of Hinduism. I'm guessing he's not atheist anymore, though. Um, I'm making that assumption here. I don't know. Let me know if you know whether um, Lakani here is uh, still atheistic through through and through, or did he actually believe in a higher power, a, a god, if you will. And let me know that. I mean, like he said in the, in the earlier video, I just happened to see that. It's like, well, that's great. This works well together. You know, you know can an atheist be a Hindu? And how an atheist becomes a teacher. So I'm like, this this works well together. So it looks like you can be, because he does have very much a love for science. I believe he teaches um, the metaphys metaphysics, I believe it was. Or the quantum. I can't remember. It was something really weird. But nonetheless, I don't know if he believes in a higher power or whether he believes in science. He did say he believes in science, but I don't know if he said he believes in higher power. He does talk a lot about the spirit and God, but I'm just wondering if that's just because the people he's talking to um, do believe, so he will speak to them in those terms, because uh, we hold something to our higher standards to ourselves. Uh, those who follow religion uh, hold God to higher standards to themselves, and I think he does hold science to a very high standard. He does explain that, but I just don't know if he believes in God now. So let me know. I, I, I've never thought to ask that. I've always assumed that maybe he does. The way he spoke in other videos, it seems like he does, but I've not really confirmed that. Anyways, that's my reaction to this video. If you like my content, please consider subscribing, thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.